Good guess. One. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So this is our pavement management and paving plan. Um, the company we use is named Street Scan. This is a sort of cartoon version of their vehicle, but next slide is um, the actual vehicle. It's a Honda Fit outfitted with a GPS unit so it knows where it is and it you know and then it's got a 3D 360 camera on the roof so they get basically similar to Google Earth imagery or Google Street View imagery um, and then there's a 3D laser camera on the back that measures every single crack bump pothole you name it and as well as getting the imagery um, of the actual asphalt surface so that's the street scan vehicle. Uh, this time around they came, uh, I forgot it was, I think it was June. They came this past June, uh, June 2021. Uh, they drove around town for five days, did all 103.5 miles of road, uh, including some yet to be accepted subdivisions uh, because they're sort of on the horizon for being accepted. Um, and then they took about three to four, now closer to four months to process all the data. And we got delivery sometime in November of 2021. Um, so that's the vehicle they use. And I'll go to the next slide. This is all the stuff they get out of the 3D camera, all the different pavement distresses, including bumps, potholes, uh, existing patches. They get the longitudinal cracks, the horizontal cracks. Uh, these are, this is called block cracking, uh, alligator cracking, and then they can even detect when it's been crack sealed, which is a, just a preventative measure. Um, so they collect all that different bits and pieces of data, including location. They run it through this sort of complicated algorithm and they can spit out, um, they spit out uh, PCI. PCI stands for Pavement Condition Index, and it's a scale of zero to 100, zero being the worst, 100 being the best. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, oh, and then the PCIs get ranked, they rank them by color. So, I, uh, so 85 to 100 is excellent and so on and so forth, down to zero to 10 is a failed road. Um, and once they analyze all our streets, oh, here's, here's just some examples. Um, so this would be, looking at this, it's like a brand new paved road, basically. So it's 85 to 100, excellent condition. Um, go down to good condition. It's pretty good. It's got a little, it's been crack sealed once. It's got some other cracks forming, but still in pretty good shape overall. Um, so that's a 70 to an 85. Um, this is getting into the very poor. You've got all this alligator cracking. You've got some sort of rutting going on. And it's, this road is pretty close to getting another couple of years of freeze thaw and this road will be failing. Um, then you've got, this has failed. This is all mm -hmm. sorts of patchwork quilts, uh, potholes, patches, cracks galore. It's, it's almost back to dirt. So that's an example of just a near failure. Um, then once they tabulate all that info, they, they process our results. And from those results, we get a town-wide map, a color-coded town-wide map with all our different street segments, color-coded from good to bad. Green are all in relatively good condition. Yellow is still fair. Uh, orange is heading down the downward spiral. And then the reds, become those are the really bad roads. And you can see here, we've got just a few short stretches of red around town. Uh, there's up here is Market Hill. There's a tiny side street off of Rolling Ridge. I think that's Birchcroft. We've got Old North Pleasant Street here next to Kendrick Park, which we've got some plans for. Uh, we've got Kendrick Place, Woodside Ave. I, you know, it, there's a section of Old Farm Road. Here's a little bit of uh, Pomeroy Lane and one of our top complaints this spring has been Bay Road down here. And you can see it's bad, but it's not the worst. Uh, it did go through some extra, so the scan was back in June of last year and this winter uh, Bay Road suffered some additional distress from the freeze thaw cycles we had. So that's the map we get and that's sort of what we use to base our paving decisions on. Um, should I stop for questions in the middle? Does anybody, or should I just plow right through, finish out? 
I, I think get, go through and then we can ask our, our questions. Uh, although I, I see Anna's hand is up. Um, I'm fine to wait. I just wanted to raise it before I forgot. So go ahead, Jason. Okay, great. Um, so this is another thing they provide, mm. which is useful, but on a more macro micro scale, they, they have actual distresses mapped out with all these symbols. It's hard to see from this scale, but mm -hmm. you know, they, they categorize right. all the different types of distresses. And that that's actually helpful when it comes down to deciding what uh, surface treatment you want to do, like how you want to repair the road, because certain certain failures don't lend themselves well to certain repairs. So that just sort of helps in your decisions on how to repair a road. Um, there's nothing better than actually walking the road, honestly, but but this help from the office, this is a good step. Um, so that's our distress map. Um, and then we get an entire list of every road in town. We have 732 segments total. And, you know, some streets are just one segment. Other streets are broken up every uh, from every side street to every intersection to every little piece. So some roads have 50 segments. Some roads are just one segment. And they all get their, their PCI, their length, and their, their basically their, their grade. So, you know, you've got 74s, 40, Blackberry Lane is not so hot, Thistle Lane not looking so good at a 38, and the, then we get this whole tabulated index. Um, this is just a, an excerpt from that list, um, but that helps us with our decisions. Um, then we get, this is our, this is sort of our overall report card here. This is our 2022 PCI status, our average condition. You take all the road segments, take their average and we have an overall of a 65, which is pretty good. And then you calculate the backlog, which is a big scary number, almost $50, $50 million. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to go forward just yet. So close to 50 million, that's a big scary number. That's what it would take to take this needle and jam it up to 100. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lofty goal, but that's not something I think we could ever really reasonably achieve. Um, we can keep the keep the needle climbing, hopefully, and uh, and we'll go from there. Um, this is from our last scan in 2018. Our average was 63. Um, and we had a couple that were in failure. Like so we had this 8% of the roads were zero to 10 or sorry, uh, 10 to 25. And we had a, a full failure road. I can't remember which one it was, honestly, off the top of my head, but we have, have at, since taken care of those roads. And if you, I know it's pie chart versus bar chart, but if you look now, we've gotten rid of those really low, those really bad roads. And we only have, you know, a few in very poor condition, very, you know, only three miles of it. Um, we've got a fair amount in the orange, which that, those all need work too, but but so we've definitely improved. We went from an overall 63 to a 65. So that's good for three years worth of work at a very reasonable budget of under, under 2 million a year average. And we'll get to that a little later. Um, so I'll just keep going forward here. Then we go through the algorithm to figure out what we repair, when we repair it and how we repair it. And the program is very useful for running different budget scenarios. You can kind of do a shoot for the moon budget. You can try to maintain a certain PCI, or you can just take the budget you're given and run that out over five years. And that's that's more we do do some pie in the sky dreaming, like how much money to get it to a you know a 70 PCI. And it's always too much money that you don't want to don't want to hear the answer to. But um, basically, so this is our decision tree. Um, so from zero to 40, we'd have to do full depth reconstruction, which usually reclaim the entire road, turn it back to dirt, and then repave it. And that's, you know, about $100 a square yard. Uh, mill and overlay, when it's still between a 40 and a 70, you can usually get away with that. And that's a quarter of the cost of full depth. Um, then there's crack sealing or surface treatments. Crack sealing averages about a dollar a square yard, whereas some of these other surface treatments, like a like a rubber chip seal. We haven't done a lot of those in town. Hadley does a lot, but those are like $5 a square yard. And then from 90 to 100, we typically try to leave it alone unless it needs a little bit of crack seal because um, it's good to preserve. When you're, when you're in this 70 to 100 range, it's really good to keep those roads preserved because the longer you can keep them up in that end, the, the, the more you get out of your budget. Um, so we'll go to the next 
slide. This is just one of the outputs of the program. It can do a repair suggestion table where you put in a certain budget number and it spits out a list of roads and the different kinds of treatments that should do in, a, in an average cost. So, you know, Blackberry Lane, Mill and Overlay, $38,000. And, and you can spit out a million different scenarios and you can prioritize by main road, by side street, by, uh, vol, you know, by whatever traffic volume is. And we sort of tend to put a little heavier weight on the main roads because we get more complaints on those. And then we put lesser of a priority on some of the smaller side streets and dead ends, but we do try to get around to them eventually. Um, so this is just one example of a, of a repair suggestion table. Um, and there can be, there's also, you can look at it on a map scale where they tell you every single treatment you should do to every single road. Um, not that we could afford to do all that, but you can kind of look at it on a zone by zone basis and see, you know, um, the green ones are all in great shape. Uh, the blue ones just need some real basic maintenance, crack sealing. Uh, the yellow could go for mill and overlay. And then the, the pink ones are those ones that were also red and they need more full depth reconstruction. Um, so then you get your repair suggestion map. And this is our, this is our, uh, our, bat, our naughty list basically. This is our worst roads of spring 2022 based on the scan from June of 2021. And these are all the roads with a PCI below 40. And you can see a lot of them are small, very short roads. This piece of Stony Hill is just one of the small little turnoffs off of Stony Hill. Um, there's a small section of Old Farm. Uh, there's a pretty big section of Pomeroy Lane. Uh, a lot of these are short little, short little sections in North Pleasant. Uh, a good chunk of College Street, which uh, really blew up this spring and could use it. Um, and just, you know, this is just our, our worst our worst list and a take care of them would be about $2 million. Um, we, as much as we'd love, doing the worst first isn't always your best investment though. Sometimes you really have to stay on the main roads, stay where the traffic is heaviest to stay ahead of those and try to pick away at some of the small ones as you go. So as much as we'd love to just wipe this slate clean and be done with it, at the same time, we'd be losing some of our main roads. Um, so we'll go to the next. Uh, this is just going to be a list of the roads we've done over the last six years and sort of the average budget we've paid over the last six years. And this is all sorts of combinations of funds in, in mostly chapter 90, but sometimes water and sewer funds, other times uh, CDBG projects. Um, there's sort of a whole combination. I didn't list funding sources on this table. Um, but you can see 2021, we did about $2 million worth. Uh, 2020, we did about a million. 2019 was 1.5 million. And if you look at between 2020 and 2019, there's sort of some repeats here. And that's just because we split these roads in two parts. We did the base coat in 2019, and then we held off and did the top coat in 2020. And that was, a lot of that was uh, used sewer funds. That was part of the sewer expansion project in the Amherst, uh, Hill, uh, Amherst Woods area. Um, so that was a combination of funds and it worked out to split it year by year so we could afford it. Uh, then there's just the, the, the three years prior to that we did, you know, 1.9 million, 1 1.2, uh, another million here. So that's, that's our, av you know, our average budget is, ranges from one to two million, depending on what we have for extra funding. Um, and we try to spread it out as much as we can throughout town. We try to hit as many main streets as possible. And a lot of times if we're hitting a main street and there's a really bad side street next to it, we try to hit both of those at the same time because it saves us a little bit on mobilization. Um, so then we've got our proposed work for 2022. And this is what we got out of the program. We kind of use the program to do our planning for the next couple of years. And so what we'll be going through is just, this will be our rehab and reconstruction 2022, our preventative maintenance for 2022. We've got a sidewalk plan for 2022. Uh, we've got some other grant funded projects that are going forward in the next year or two. And then we've even projected out to 2023, which I sometimes uh, am afraid to do because people tend to hold you to them. And if the budget doesn't allow, sometimes the budget doesn't allow, uh, but we'll go through them and see if we can set these goalposts and and achieve all these in the next couple of years.
Um, so this year, this is currently out to bid. Uh, we're opening bids next Thursday. Um, so these are already out to bid. We've advertised. We're waiting for prices to come in. These are our estimated costs. Uh, Bay Road's a big one. We've got a ton of complaints about that. East Hadley Road will help wrap up a, a CDBG project where we did the multi-use paths over there and did some widening for bike paths or bike lanes. Um, Leverett Road, that is a major complaint road that is, uh, has gotten pretty bad over the last winter. Uh, Meadow Street, while we're on Meadow Street, we're going to hit Russellville Road because it's right there and it's in fairly similar condition. Um, then we've got Pulpit Hill Road. Oh, that's, we're doing Pulpit Hill Road because we're going to do Leverett Road and they're right next to each other. So it makes sense to do them at the same time. Uh, and then since we're also doing Bay Road and that touches Harris Mountain, we're going to hit Harris Mountain while we're there. And then we've got Kellogg Ave, which wraps up. We've got a current CDBG project to do the sidewalks on Kellogg. And doing the road right after the sidewalk project is completed will um, sort of put the bow on that project so that we can afford it. We can, we can spend our CDGB dollars on the sidewalks, concentrate on that, and then we use Chapter 90 or paving funds to finish Kellogg, the remainder of Kellogg Ave. And then Pomeroy Lane, which I'm praying makes the list. I hope our prices come in. I'm not all that optimistic based on inflation right now, but we'd love to hit Pomeroy <laughs> Lane, except it is about a million dollar chunk of the budget. So that, that adds, makes our budget, our estimated budget puts it up around $3 million, which I know we don't have. And, and you know, I'm realistic about it, but uh, I'm hopeful that the prices come in lower than we anticipate. And we'll just sort of have to see where that goes next Thursday when we open bids. Um, the state also released a little bit of extra funds this year, which I'm just not sure when we'll see those funds and if they'll be, we'll be able to apply them to this year or next year. Um, but that's all the chapter 90 and the extra chapter 90. Um, then we've got our crack sealing plan, which we plan to start uh, within the next month or so, we'll get out and crack seal. And these are all roads that have been recently paved. Um, they're, they're, they're basically consider these as our investments. We've even, we've repaired, we've put rebuilt these roads back to brand new, and we want to keep them that way. And if a small crack opens up, water gets in it, water water freezes and thaws, starts to blow the road apart. If we can crack seal it ahead of time stop any water from getting in there that saves the road in the long term so we try to spend you know and these are this the our current contract it's only 44 cents a square yard which is just it's you know it's it's the best money you can spend on uh, short it's best small it's it's pennies over pennies over dollars basically as far as the repair you know how the longevity works on those um, so it makes sense to keep keep up our preventative plan and keep our good roads uh, the way they are and we've got our sidewalk replacement plan. We had a couple of lists uh, from, from a couple different boards and committees. I think one was the DAAC. Um, I'm blanking. Guilford, help me out. Did we have another list from someone else? Or was it just DAAC? There was a couple other wish lists for school routes um, and whatnot. And we sort of went through and picked out some sidewalks that were in bad shape. Uh, some that were uh, relatively easy to do. There's some certain slopes that just are not doable to meet handicap standards. So we picked out uh, some low hanging fruit to try and get some of these sidewalks back in shape. And we settled on, we're currently do, working on Amity Street. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to click that. Uh, there, we picked Taylor Street from Mattoon to High Street, Gray Street from Taylor to Maine, McClellan from Lincoln to North Pleasant Street, if we can get the tree hearings done in time, and uh, Anity Street, like I said, we're already working on both sides of the road uh, from Lincoln to North Prospect, and then Chestnut Street is sort of a maybe if it fits in the budget at the end of the at the end of the projects, we'll do Chestnut Street from East Pleasant to the Middle School. Uh, so that's our sidewalk projects. I'll go on to our grant funded projects. Um, we just uh, had our pre-construction on these two CDGB projects, which we bundled into one bid. One is Mill Lane from West Street to the Groff Park entrance, which will sort of complete the multi-use path we did on East Hadley Road and sort of connects East Hadley Road to Groff Park to the new spray park, um, gives much better improved pedestrian access, bicycle access, everything, and improves the safety on all of it. 
Um, so that was CDBG funded. We had to come up with an additional $67,000 to, uh, to make the total here because the CDBG funds didn't cover everything. Um, so I think that just came out of general fund money. And then Kellogg Ave, we're doing the sidewalks with CDBG money and we'll do the roadway with other funds. Uh, and then we've got the MassWorks grant for the West Street and Pomeroy Lane intersection, the proposed roundabout, which I'm excited about. I hope we can afford to do it for 1.5 million. That's a little bit of a stretch, but we'll make it work. Um, and this is our 2023 list, which we just sort of put together. This covers a lot of those small side streets that were in the red, actually. We're trying to hit a bunch of those as well as some main roads and trying to keep it under at least 1.5. This is, you know, it's a it's a lofty budget to meet, but we'll see what we can do. We'll see how the bid numbers come in. And so this hits a lot of those really small side streets that had that were in the red, as well as some of our major roads like College Street, Farmington is a relatively major road, Market Hill, it's it's out in the edges, but it gets a fair amount of traffic, old farm, a lot of collectors and some main streets that we'll hit with um, with our 2023 list. Uh, we've also got our crack seal list for 2023, which is some of the roads we've did, done in the last couple of years. Um, again, crack seal is pretty easy to, to, you know, easy and cheap to do. Um, we'll have to do a new bid for that. We had a three-year bid that just ran out. Uh, and that's it. Um, we can go to questions and comments. This is a picture of uh, the Mill River basketball course that we did last year. We got, we got all your three different sizes of rollers. We got the, your dump truck with the asphalt, and this is the paving machine. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. And any... Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, your comments uh, did add to the presentation, which was pretty thorough. Um, I'm going to call Anna since she put her hand up early in the game, and then I'm going to call on myself. All right. The bad news is I have three pages of questions. The good news is that they're small pages. Um, so yeah. All right. So um, Dorothy, I'll ask a few and then I'll try not to dominate too much. So question about this. I'm really glad to see Bay Road on this list. It's something that got obviously really ripped up. I, I, full disclosure, I live on Bay Road. Um, and so I, I did witness this quite a lot. But we also have gotten a lot of constituent comments about, in particular, that section from the town line to Hulst Road. So I was really, I was grateful to see that on there. My question is um, about the timing. So you're, you do the the cool little car thing, which I believe it, we contract that that's a separate company that comes in. Right. Okay. So yeah, they do that. You said, yes, thank you. So they do that in June. Yeah, they did it in June of last year. We try to do it around every three years because the data holds pretty steady for the first couple of years, but then certain roads deteriorate. They, they have these deterioration curves that they use so that when they scanned it in June 2022 and you look at it in 2023, it adds six months of deterioration. Yeah. But the roads don't always follow the model. So we like to keep it fresh at least every three years. We, we feel comfortable using the data that's two years old and the data that might be three years old and maybe four years old. But after that, it's time to go back to the drawing board and rescan everything and see where the actual deterioration has gone. Okay, because my question is about how this that cycle fits with the budget cycle, because you did say you're using mostly Chapter 90 funds, I believe. Correct. But um, as this goes through, are you then waiting another year before scheduling, scheduling these? Or is it you have a rough enough idea of what your budget's going to be that you're still able to fit them in in a timely manner? I'm thinking about like June is right before the fiscal year and we've got our budget set mm -hmm. by that point, hopefully. So what's how does that impact? Is that a problem at all or does it work pretty oh, well? So, so this year's paving list, what we've put out to bid already, we used our old data for that. So we already okay. had those roads chosen from our old model. And, and, you know, we also keep our eye on the roads too. It's not, it's not, it's, we don't just fly blind yeah. looking at this program. Um, Bay Road, we knew was going to fall apart and we've been watching it. And so that one was a no, that one was on the list before we even had Street Scan do it. So we, okay. we usually have our next year's roads picked out the year before and we we just try to stick to them sometimes other priorities come up and we don't miss we have to drop one or another for for a priority but for the most part we can use the old data until we get the new data once the new data rolls in it just helps us make a, a better informed decision 
as we go. So then, um, so, so then when you look at the different repair options, how do you factor in the longevity of each? So obviously patching doesn't last as long as fully resurfacing a road, but it's a lot cheaper and easier and, and more applicable for some damages. How do you factor, what is the what is the lifespan of each of the, I think it was slide, hang on, I wrote it down, slide 16, is that right? Um, that you talked about the different the different options. So that's part one of that question is what's the lifespan of those? Part two is how do you, um, determine how do you determine the uh are you using the classification as like an arterial roadway a main roadway as your determining factor are you considering like speed limit which i know factors into arterial versus main etc right. etc is that the classification that you use to determine which street okay yeah so we, it's not just we, if it's like a residential neighborhood no we, a, we do okay. it's arterials collectors and locals and so we okay. put a little more weight on the arterials. So if those, if an mm -hmm. arterial is in poor condition, we'll probably hit that before a failed local. Um, Great. But so there's just a little bit heavier weight on those. They, they obviously cost more every single time that they're the heavy, they're the big heavy roads. They mm -hmm. cost a lot more to repair. They're usually wider. They're usually bigger, more traffic. And mm -hmm. we have to do a more intensive treatment on them. So just this, this decision tree has basic repair methods and we have a few more than just these up our sleeve so for reconstruction that's reclaiming if we're doing an arterial road we'll do reclamation with asphalt injection and that actually turns all the rubble into like a, a eight, or eight or nine inch binder course and then we'll put five mm -hmm. inches of new blacktop on top of that so that's sort of the Cadillac treatment for roads with heavy, heavy traffic. If we're just doing a local road with reconstruction, we'll just reclaim it and pave over it because um, mm -hmm. they don't see the heavy truck traffic. But anywhere we know there's heavy truck traffic, we do a slightly more intensive treatment. And that one would probably be more like 125 per square yard versus the regular $100 a square yard. And then for mill and overlay, there's a couple different ways to approach that too. That, that won't necessarily last as long um, but it, if it, if the road's in decent enough shape, it'll hold for a while. It's not going to hold as long as a reconstruction, like a reconstruction should get you like 20 years, uh, okay. mill and overlay should get you say 10 years. And then there's other treatments within the realm of surface treatments that get you 10 years on a road that's in really good shape. And we're, we're trying okay. to lean into some of those. We'd like to see some either rubber chip seals or there's one called a cape seal where they do a chip seal and then they run a smoothing course over it so it looks like regular asphalt. So I know some people don't like the chip seal look. I don't know, anybody familiar with a lot of the treatments they do in Hadley where they sort of just drizzle oil down the road and then they drop stone on it and the stones are loose mm -hmm. for about a week or so and they kind of fly everywhere. You go through, you sweep them up with a sweeper. And, and so this cape seal is similar, but there's a surface course on top that sort of glues everything down. And it looks and feels a lot more like what we're used to for new asphalt. Um, so we're trying to branch out into a lot of the other repair methods. Um, and and it's, not, it's not as cut and dry as like we only do three things. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff we like to do. We like to try new things. Sometimes those aren't always the greatest, but uh, we do we do a fair amount of experimenting and try to try to feel out what works best. And we're, we've really been happy with the full depth reconstruction with the asphalt injection on the major roads. We've done that on mm -hmm. East Pleasant Street, uh, Northeast Street, and yeah, and the and Henry Street last year. So we're really pretty happy with that treatment. It, it's really solid. We see the trucks driving over it and it's not deforming. It, it really builds yeah. a really nice foundation and then gives you something good to put your pavement on. Yeah, okay. I have two more quick ones, Dorothy, if that's okay. Um, and, then, and then I'm done for, until we get to sidewalks. So uh, first one really quickly, when you're looking at the roads that are reconstruction, um, you know, I have to do my due diligence as a cyclist here and ask about the cost implications of adding reflective paint for the shoulder lane, um, as well as the um, potential of adding a rumble strip for roads like Bay Road that are really fast. So um, roads like Bay Road where people do bike and run on them, obviously you can't, well, maybe not obviously, I don't see how you could add a sidewalk without that being a huge, huge, or a separate bike lane without that being a massive project. So I'm curious about what are the cost implications and are there considerations because it's not about expansion, it is within the project. What are the cost implications of adding 
I'm particularly interested in the rumble strip idea, but also that reflective, you know what I'm talking about? Like that, I mean, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. Like that, that, um, shoulder plate that kind paint. of, Thermal thank you, Gilford. I knew you'd come It's raised and super reflective. Yeah. It's like aggressively reflective. Yeah. So I'm curious yeah. about if that's a consideration as you're doing specifically that reconstruction, not obviously it's not for a mill and overlay. Maybe right. I, not right. Uh, so just for the could. reconstruction. You could do it anywhere, Maybe. honestly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the regular, we do the, we do a lot of our painting in-house and we mm -hmm. use regular, um, uh, regular uh, water-based paint uh, and it lasts about a year. We do sprinkle the reflective beads in the paint while it's still wet. So we do get a little bit of reflectivity, but it's not, it's not a raised bump like the thermoplast is, and it doesn't last as long. We have to redo it every year. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the in-house paint costs, but sort of the industry standard is like 20 cents a foot versus the thermoplast is upwards of a dollar to a dollar 50 a foot. Um, so it's a pretty big cost when you're doing a couple thousand feet of road. Um, but sometimes in these high traffic areas where it's difficult to even, you know, even when our guys go and paint it, it's, it's not comfortable to be yeah. riding down Bay road with cars honking at you and you're taking mm -hmm. up a lane. Um, so sometimes where we think we'll get five years out of it, if yeah. we do thermoplast versus paint, it, sometimes it makes sense. Um, on the roundabouts, we like to do thermoplast because there's so much wear and tear. The vehicle's all turning on your on your paint marks. Um, right. We'd like to do thermoplast for roundabouts for sure. Um, and we we you know the the new downtown crosswalks those are imprinted thermoplast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we really like those. So I mean, yeah. it, it's a, we we look at it on a case by case basis, and sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes the budget dictates that we can't afford to do it after we've done all the $2 million worth of roads, and we have to just paint it in-house, so. And then the, the rumble strip, the thin, so, not the thick rumble strip, but the thin rumble strip. I'll just answer the, the rumble strip if you want, Jason. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We haven't done a whole lot of those. You just mean so the we, one that down the white line, the edge yeah. rumbles? Okay. Yeah. So we have not done those because people complain about the noise. Yeah. Um, and like, just, like at neighbors yeah residential yes. anytime there's a house nearby if, if okay. there's a truck that's going to cut a corner and brrr, got you know, it get everywhere a lot of yeah i mean people complain about noise from potholes now because pretty much the town of amherst has gone from a rural community into a very urban community um there's houses everywhere and whenever we do something or we don't do something and noise is a consideration we hear about it pretty quickly so we've stayed away from rumble strips. We were going to put rumble strips on College Street when we put in the raised mm -hmm. round, the raised crosswalks, but that was one of the considerations was that you'd constantly hear that sound of people driving across it at night and it wasn't something people wanted. So that's why you've never, we've never done those in town. Thank you. you. I'm, I'm sick of hearing myself talk, so I'm gonna stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure other people might have the same questions as me. So Dorothy, I'm done. All right. For now. Um, I have four classes of questions, I'll be quick. Um, I like your list of roads, but I uh, noticed a few blocks that weren't in there that are in terrible shape. Uh, one, I'm sure you're aware of, the block of Lincoln between Amity and Northampton Street. Um, it is, uh, it's a scandal. It's, uh, you know, I, I have a new car, but when my car, I, I drove some of these roads again today, it was just, you know, banging up the whole car. Um, the other one is Nutting Street, uh, Phillips Street, and the beginning of fearing. Uh, those streets are very bad. Um, and I'm, so I'm gonna ask you why you didn't include them. Um, I'll save my sidewalk later, the question till later. Um, but um, this tie, my next question ties very nicely into the question about rumble strips. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, the effect of the reflectors that Deerfield, the town of Deerfield had put in some a new road project, which helped me drive in a terrible fog uh, the, the same night that a pedestrian got hit on Mass Ave. Um, and I saw how wonderful it was to have reflecting reflectors on the side of the road so you even knew where the road was and to have them on both sides of the yellow line telling you pass, no pass or whatever. So uh, I wanna ask if you're gonna use those. Um, and um, then my third question is about bike lanes. Um, I will tell you that when I go back to um, Long Island City, Sunnyside, Queens, the, the neighborhood's in a complete uproar because uh, the mayor is, well, the previous mayor uh, is totally insane for bike lanes. 
And what he has is you have the sidewalk, then you have a bike lane, then he has cars parked in the road, and then he has moving traffic. And we see that as death trap. So I just was wanting to know your philosophy of bike lane. Um, and that will be it for now. Thank you. Which one you want, Jason? Oh, boy. Um, I guess Lincoln, Phillips, and Nutting. I mean, we did look at those. We seriously considered them, but they weren't, they're not as high traffic as the ones we have chosen. And they're, you know, they they can hold out another year. Um, I don't know if they made that second year list. I didn't pay as much attention to that. My 2023 list. I, I mean, they really should Lincoln. be on a 2023 list. The, the, the Lincoln block is, is very short. Um, yeah. But so it's, it's Lincoln is better than, see, if you look at all the PCIs in our 2023 list, they're all 40 and below. And Lincoln mm -hmm. was just a little bit higher than that. And it's, I mean, and it's, it's right there with a bunch of other roads in town. I'm sure Phillips and Nutting are all about a 45. Um, okay. Well, I just want to urge you to put them on because uh, one of the, one of the things when you see a road like that in a neighborhood, which is um, perhaps some people would say under threat, it, it makes people think, oh, nobody cares about this street. I can do anything I want here. And that means I can litter, I can party, I can just do anything because nobody cares. Um, so that is just something for you to, to think about. Um, okay, then well, the next question. Dorothy, Dorothy I, I mean, that's really comes down to a lot more money because if you want to have a, I mean, that means everyone, everything in the 60 to 70 range, and we need a lot more money to take care of them. But the budget just won't support that. So we do take the worst ones. And I understand there's there's a lot of neighborhoods who say the same thing you say. We have potholes yeah. in the street. The street looks like a third world country. I'm yeah. curious which yeah. third world countries they go to because a couple of ones I've been to, some of them are a lot worse. Um, exactly. So it, it's it's just it's just people's perceptions, and it's true if if people perceive it's not being taken care of. But then again, it does take more money. Um, right. and we're getting more money, and we're we're working it more in there. For the reflector question, yeah, we've not used reflectors in town. They typically run well. The last time I looked was about five years ago. They typically ran uh, anywhere from six to ten dollars a reflector. Yeah. And if you want to keep them from being plowed up by the snow plows, you have to recess them. So that is a little addition, additional money is to cut a groove in the pavement for a recess for the reflector. Um, even so, that didn't work that well. I just walked this short stretch of the state Route 116 at the bottom of West Street. There's reflectors all over the gutter line. They all got plowed out. Mm. So I don't even know that the recessing works very well. I don't know how much, I mean, some of them stay, but I don't think you get the best return on your dollar for those. But then I guess on, with them, the reflective paint that Anna was talking about, because I think it really, really is important. We get bad weather, we get fogs. It's important to know where the edge of the road is and where the middle of the road is. So then the reflective paint is possible. Um, at one time, the bike community wasn't very thrilled about the thermoplastic paint. Because mm -hmm. the thermoplastic paint does get slippery. And if you're in a bike wow. lane and it's raining or a little foggy or the snow's melted and it's wet, you could, if you have to make a movement fast or cross the line fast, you could slip. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons we stayed away from thermoplastic. Um, we can go back and talk about thermoplastic or epoxy paints. Epoxies aren't as, as slippery but you're still talking at the higher higher dollar amount for ins installation. They do it does last longer though, and there's some there is some can be some cost benefit with some of the projects we do. Um, on the bike lanes, yeah. Um, you actually might see your proposal to do exactly what you were talking about sometime in the world at Amherst. Um, there is a lot of talk about moving bike lanes closer to the sidewalks so that you aren't, the bikes are not in the travel lane with the cars. Um, so there could be a proposal at some point to put parking next to the travel lane and bike lanes next to the sidewalk. The thing about Amherst is, is that we have narrow public ways and we don't have enough space 
in the public way to put every, everything people want. You can't have really wide sidewalks. You can't have really wide tree belts. You can't have parking and then the travel lanes and bike lanes. It's just, that's a lot of, that's a lot of real estate. And some of our public ways just don't have that much real estate to have all that in there. So you have to figure out a way to share it mm-hmm. and make some compromises to make it all fit. And that's kind of how we try to make it work. Okay. So I'm just going to let you know that, that people where they've done that, where they have wider roads, there's a lot of people who are very unhappy with it because they think it's unsafe because you can't see the biker coming out from around the parked car. But you're saying we can't really do that anyway because our roads aren't wide enough. No, okay, there's only I, a few. Yeah. I'm going to call on Shalini. Yeah. Um, so what I heard you say is like you have a, you have certain criteria even within the roads that are pretty critical. That's like 1.9 million. So I'm sure like even within that there is criteria that's being used to prioritize. And one of the criteria I heard was the number of cars going or the like main streets and so forth, right? So could you elaborate on the different criteria that is used? Because I can imagine things like, but that's maybe more for um, pavement. That what I was going to say is more relevant, like uh, seniors walking or school paths and so forth. So maybe just both, like for roads, what is the criteria used to prioritize and and also for pavements. So for the roads, we really only do a a short, like a very small um, preference for arterials and collectors. Um, It's about a 40-60 split. So we put like maybe 60% towards arterials and collectors. And then whatever's left over, we try to spread amongst the locals that are in bad shape. So we don't do a heavy preference for them, but they do carry heavier weight and they they take bigger bites out of the budget. So that's, Mm -hmm. so the second you put an arterial in front of a local, the arterial eats up most of the budget and then you have little bits and pieces left to fill in the the local roads. So it doesn't take much to give a little bit of, you know, they they carry a lot more residents, they carry more traffic, that that's where you're gonna get your more complaints is on those arterials and the collectors. So it's it's in our best interest to do those. We're gonna get the most complaints, we're gonna get claims for damages. Um, Mm -hmm. If only four people live on a street, and and it's it's upsetting to say it, but if there's only four houses on a street, it doesn't get that much traffic. It doesn't carry that much weight and okay. and it can last another year with some pothole patches. Um, we do get to them. Like if you look at this 2023 list, we're hitting, I think Bellevue Circle has two houses on it. Um, mm-hmm. so we do get to them. Thistle, I, I, I had this brought up at a dinner party, someone who lived on Thistle Lane and there's <laughs> six houses and she says, why hasn't my road been done? <laughs> Thanks for fun dinner party conversation. I'm like, <laughs> You have six houses on your street. I'm sorry. We, we right. have major roads that carry thousands of cars a day that mm-hmm. need a little more attention. But we we do try to get to them eventually. And they might have to suffer an extra year or two till we get there. But we get there. And the pavements, which are like maybe closer to schools or seniors, or is there a criteria so like that for pavements? I feel like that would be more like sidewalks. And we don't. I mean, have- sidewalks. Yes. So we, this, the company we use, the street scan company, they have a method to scan sidewalks, but it's fairly labor intensive. So they, oh. they take these little baby stroller versions of the Honda Fit and they can walk every sidewalk in town. I think they even have one of those, um, hmm. those, uh, one of those two wheeled things. I can never remember the name of those things. Segway. Segway. Segways. Thank you. Oh, they have those little two wheeled segways <laughs> that they can ride with the yeah, sensors attached good. to them and they can ride up and down all the sidewalks in town, but it's going to take a whole lot more and than I- five days and it mm-hmm. costs a whole lot more than I think we paid five or seven thousand okay. dollars <laughs> for the streets to be scanned. And I think, did they give us an estimate, Guilford? Do you remember? around 60 i think it was 60 to do the whole thing i think you're yeah sixty thousand to scan mm. all the sidewalks in town so that's a big chunk of budget that we didn't mm. sure so what is pavement then i, I was taking pavement to mean sidewalk oh I mean, in India so, we call well pavement, pavement sidewalk. it's the it's the road and i mean the both the sidewalks and the roads are all pavement but 
Um, for the pavement management program, we focus on the roads, and typically, if the road has an adjacent sidewalk, we'll and if if it's in need of repair, we'll usually do both at the same time. So we try to mm -hmm. treat the sidewalks when we do the roads, if we can, if we can afford it. Um, but as far there, there's no we don't have a specific sidewalk management plan, like a sidewalk pavement management plan. Mm -hmm. um, we try to keep an eye on it. We do take input from the different boards and committees who, who have a say in that sort of mobility type stuff. Mm. Um, like the, the sidewalk list I had up here, where'd it go? Mm. This, this sidewalk list was built based on some specific requests from the Disability Access Advisory Committee. Mm. Um, so, and that group has a lot of activity in the schools, a lot of activity at Bank mm -hmm. Center, uh, some seniors on it, some mobility challenged people, some visually challenged folks as well. So I think it, mm -hmm. it rep represents a good it, spectrum of, of the population that we mm -hmm. do want to pay attention to for, for fixing sidewalks and making them more accessible. Um, okay. So okay. we take it on a case by case basis that way, but we don't have a great management system for how we address all our sidewalks in all of town right you can ask one more question then about uh, okay um, and then and then i and Nika, i see and then go in. yes okay. for sure okay. uh and is there a way to share uh this chart and uh the priorities that the town staff is laying out with the public so the public knows what to expect and anticipate no <laughs> should we do that should we be doing no. that? No. We actually do do it when yeah. every time we do us we do a scan we'll update the town website and you'll actually be able to go to the map. Uh -huh. And you'll be able to zoom into your street and see how your street relates to everybody else. Really? Um, yeah, it's on the town website. And um, not up yet. We haven't updated it yet. I think the old, the old version, stuff is there. I think the 2018 version of this map is available online and you can physically zoom in to specific oh, yeah. segments, your specific location, your road, and uh -huh. see what its pavement condition index was. And we're working mm -hmm. with IT to try and get this updated map loaded as well. So okay. that it's, a, it's a zoomable, usable, you know, uh, uh, functional map instead of just a fixed image. It, it's under the Public Works Department under pavement. Thank you. And then you, you can also, if you're on the GIS system, you can click on a road and it'll tell you the index for that road, but we have to have that updated too. So it just tells yeah. last, last scan up indexes. And then we only post probably two years worth of pavement list. We don't usually post the whole five-year plan Mm -hmm. um we've done it in the past but like jason says um people have um some really long memories and when year five shows up and we didn't get to their street it's like yeah. um it can be very painful um, <laughs> yes okay thank you um anika Thank you. Yes. So I've learned a lot, namely how to, you know, refer to the, you know, the different types of damages on the streets. I would have never thought, you know, alligator uh, cracking, but now, now I can't unsee it. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> the majority of my questions have been asked, but I am curious um, as to whether the results on the um, distress and the average scale um, did they match up or align with your the top complaints? Um, I'm especially interested to know how did potholes line up? Like were they number one? I can't remember um, if you've seen that. And and also, unless I'm mistaken, um, if the scale was saying uh, that 40% of the roads, the town roads were in poor condition, do you know where, like, how that averages out, Nick? You know, maybe with within the state for different towns, like, where do we, where do we average up? That is a good question. I don't know that I haven't really compared us to other towns. The state has the numbered routes categorized, and I'd say we're pretty close with the state numbered routes, even though they have probably quadruple the budget we have. I would quadruple probably 10 or 20 times the budget we have. Um, so I think we're equivalent with some of the state rankings, but I don't know on a town by town basis, a lot of different towns use a lot of different systems. 
That's um, it. Yeah. I could talk to Street Scan actually and see what other towns they do mm -hmm. and what their sort of averages are. Um, I know they do. They do a lot of towns in Massachusetts or across the country, actually. Um, so we could talk to them and find that, find out about that. Could um, I ask one more just about the a sidewalk question? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So uh, disclosure: I'm on I'm on Chestnut Street. Glad to see that was on the list. But um, I do also walk on uh, McClellan quite often, and I I don't think that this is probably a an issue that's um, limited to McClellan, but I've noticed that on some of the sidewalks, it's almost like you're walking on a wave. And so I'm interested to know, is that through wear and tear or was that like the design of, of the sidewalk and that it was it was paved that way originally? I think, well, it's, it's a little bit of both, honestly. A lot of times it's gonna be tree roots. You know, the tree roots make the sidewalk buckle. And those are those little peaked sections of, of cracked pavement and that'll buckle the sidewalk other times it's just the method that was used to pave it if you don't pave a sidewalk using an actual machine like a sidewalk paver if you're just kind of shoveling asphalt out of the back of a truck and raking it as smooth as you can get it you can never get a perfectly flat surface it's always going to be some thicker and thinner spots and you will have that sort of wavy treatment and uh you know, 10 to 20 years ago, Amherst did a lot of sidewalks by hand. Our, our highway crews used to do a fair amount of sidewalk every summer, but they were doing it by hand and it, it doesn't always come out perfect. It's really hard to rake something smooth mm -hmm. and then hit it with a roller and have it stay that exact same smoothness. Um, so it, it's a function of tree roots, uh, drive. A lot of times the people put a driveway in after you do a sidewalk and they'll just drop mm -hmm. the sidewalk down and, and make it inaccessible. And if they didn't pull a permit, we don't always catch it. So yeah. there's, there's a whole list of factors that come into play when, when you, know, you come about mm -hmm. sidewalks. Are those issues addressed when they're repaved? We do try to address them as best we can. The driveways, especially, that that's a that can be a really sore subject when you know you've got a perfectly accessible sidewalk, then somebody cuts their driveway a foot mm -hmm. deeper and just drops the sidewalk down, and mm -hmm. now it's no longer technically handicap accessible. Um, so that's why we have driveway permits. Not everybody mm -hmm. takes them out when they do a driveway. Uh, we try to catch them, but we don't catch everybody. Right. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call Paul out of turn on it just because he may have something that he wants no to worries. right now. Okay. Thank you. So there are two things I'd like Jason to address um, that are re relevant to what was just asked by, by Councillor Lopes. One is, um, what, I know that um, when you choose sidewalks, there's, there's sort of harder sidewalks to pave than easier ones. Like if there are trees nearby, uh, then you have to like take down trees that, that adds cost to a project. And the other is the way is how ADA um, requirements. So you have to follow the, the, um, the grade of the road. And if some of our sidewalks go up or down and you, you have to then excavate and make that accessible. And so rather than do that, you might say, I have all these other sidewalks that need attention. I'm gonna put my money, get the most bang for our buck. Is that how you think about things? Yeah, it is. I mean, we looked, the, the section of Amity we're doing right now is the flatter section of Amity. The, uh, the, the, after you pass Lincoln Ave on Amity Street, the road grade drops down to close to 10 or 12%. And that's technically illegal for a sidewalk, but there's a variance. If the road is 10%, the sidewalk can be 10%. And that's not great for wheelchairs and stuff, but it's still, it's allowable. The tricky part comes at the road crossings. So for, at every road crossing, you're supposed to have a level landing area for handicap uh, accessibility, which is a 2% or less level landing. And if you do a 2% landing on a 10% hill, you now need to do a 12% sidewalk to catch up to your 10% hill. And so it's sort of a, it's a, a, it's a game you can't win um, without doing some zigzags or retaining walls. It starts, the project gets extremely expensive very quickly. Um, when you try to do roads that are steep or roads that have a hundred driveway cuts, 
um, those costs really begin to add up because you have to, every time you cross a driveway with a sidewalk, you got to make sure that a Prius can get over it without bottoming out. So sometimes you have to pave 20 feet of driveway just to make sure that driveway still works. Um, so a lot of times for this year, we did, we looked at sort of the low hanging fruit, the flatter roads, the easier sidewalks um, and stayed away from the ones I mean, on, if, if we were to seriously do Amity to try and meet all the handicap standards, I think we would probably have to go to the um, accessibility, the access, accessibility Access Board, the AAB, and request variances for that one. Because I, I really don't think there's a way to legitimately make that road 100% uh, handicap accessible without doing some really crazy zigzaggy sidewalks or retaining walls up against people's property that aren't exactly that appealing. And, and certain, certain aspects like that make some of these, the handicap rigs make some of these sidewalks very difficult to do over. Or, or you have to use handrails and putting handrails at the intersections or in front of people's houses and then having the handrails at the appropriate place, but then having enough room for the snow clearing and then having it so the snow clearing doesn't destroy the handrails. Mm -hmm. That's why we try to do the easier ones first. The other difficult ones are the ones adjacent to wetlands where we actually need to widen the sidewalk. Yeah, um, there's a stream crossing. Crossing wetlands and getting permission to widen the sidewalk, which is good for people, means it's gotta be bad for the little animals in the wetlands and that makes it harder to do as well. So we kind of shy away from those as well. Okay, um, uh, Anna, you can speak. Yeah, uh, Jason, you don't, you don't like Priuses. Um, so the, no, I'm getting the Priuses. Totally They're just very so, low to the ground. So they are, they are low. Okay, so question about, I wanna um, sort of endorse Anika's question and, and really back that up, that it would be great to hear from you all if you if you do reach out to street, Streetscape, um, hear back from them. I mean, I think, I know I'm not alone in, in the, one of the one of the top things I hear all the time is I know exactly when I switch, when I cross the town line because the roads change, right? And so, um, and I also know that you all are working incredibly hard. And so I think it's, I really would like to be able to um, back that up and, and talk through. I know you don't want to have a concrete calendar um, out there because if something shifts, then it's it's really hard for folks to adapt. But I also think if we can provide some of that benchmarking and saying we're doing this at the same rate or using the same equation or something like that as as neighboring towns, um, I specifically hear this a lot switching from Pelham to Amherst on Pelham Road, uh, and so that's that's for me that's the number one anecdotally that I hear about. Um, the question I have is about sidewalks. So sidewalk uh, we. I sat on JCPC this year, which was so exciting. And um, that wasn't sarcastic, it was truly exciting. And one of the things that all that gets brought up a lot at JCPC in Guilford, I think you said this, right? Every year, someone wants a sidewalk in a new location. And so I'd really love to hear, and I, you just outlined a lot of reasons why you can't answer this question. And so I'm still gonna ask it. Um, I'm curious about the lifetime cost of a sidewalk and sort of what it is per, maybe not acre, but you know, however, whatever distance it is, when you consider how often repairs need to be made and if there's a rough estimate that you can provide so that when we look at budgeting, repairing old sidewalks versus adding new ones, because yes, I do believe there are many places in town that would benefit greatly from sidewalks being added, but it's important to consider those long-term, the, the longevity, right? The lifetime costs. I'm curious if you have or could get a rough number um, about what those costs might be. And I know there's so many factors. I know I'm asking for something impossible, but I'm curious. We, we can give you a rough number based on just a sidewalk in a nice place where you don't have to talk to Conservation Commission and there's not They're the best. A ADA issues. Have to have several That'd be great. That'd be really helpful. And, and actually, a sidewalk, sidewalks do last longer than roads. I mean, the, yeah. the two things that, well, the big thing to destroy roads is weight. So the heavier something is on the road and the more vehicles you have is more that de more deterioration. So on a sidewalk, you don't have a lot of weight normally. So you don't have to worry about that. The vehicles are people, they're light. That's not that big deal. The biggest threat to the sidewalk is a tree. Yeah. Tree, tree roots have the force. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then the last thing, I'm so sorry, I lowered it. And then I remembered. So the last thing is I, I do want to just re, uh, reflect on what Dorothy said earlier. I think that using a formula, the way that you all are using streetscape, using that sort of system is the most equitable way to do this process. And, and I really, I appreciate it. I think if we move to a system where streets are, uh, or, or no one was proposing this, but I, my concern would be in moving to a system where streets are repaired in neighborhoods who feel where their character is getting damaged or something like that really privileges older, more affluent, uh, more areas, right? And so I, I want to back up using this in a very methodical equation driven way, um, because I think that's the most equitable process. And, and I would just, yeah, wanted to stamp that. Thank you. We agree with that 100% with, with this, this, this algorithm takes the politics out of the paving. Um, we, uh, uh, there was a former superintendent that did, uh, what did he call it? He called it quieting paving. So if he got a lot of phone calls about a street, he would go pave that street and that would save him 10 to 20 phone calls a week. Um, and that's, it's not a fair way to do it. it and it yeah. doesn't work out in the long-term budget. Thank you. Um, okay, now here's a question. I saw Shalini's hand, but I see that the Andy's picture is up front, so I don't quite understand the technology. But um, Andy, if no, I'm... just Andy because he hadn't spoken, so I put okay. it down. Yeah. All right. So Actually, Shalini. I was going to say, go ahead and do Shalini first. Okay, so let's do Shalini. Right. We'll do Andy. Okay. Okay. Uh, cool. Okay. So uh, the question was around when you are redoing a certain road, is there a plan to put in bike paths? And I don't know if that was sort of answered or not. So in the past, we have tried to do that, and we've we, we we basically did try to do it when I first got here. But if you think about a bike path being four feet and two four foot lanes, that's eight feet. That's almost the width. That's two thirds of a width of a travel lane you're adding to the road. So two things happened. We found we were spending more money on paving a road, and we weren't getting enough roads paved. And so we kind of just started paving what was there already, um, unless it was really, really easy to put a bike lane in. Because adding a bike lane does the same thing as a sidewalk. You sometimes have to expand the road. You go into, you have to cut into a bank, you have to cut into a tree, you have to widen over a, um, a wetland. So um, right now we typically target where we're gonna do bike lanes and we try to do the major roads only but we don't, we haven't been doing as many as we used to because we've been finding we were just spending a lot of paving money, widening roads that we could have been used for paving more roads. And we were falling farther behind in maintenance. Hmm. Okay, okay. so that's a true that answer. Time. It may not yeah. be, oh, let me take down my own hand. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may not be the answer we like, but he gave us mm -hmm. the true answer. Can I just add to that? It's not, I mean, I agree with what you're saying and it's practical and it makes sense, but just keeping in mind that climate action, and I'm not even a biker, I wish I was, but I, I'm afraid of biking on streets because I didn't grow up that way. So, but just thinking that if you're trying to incentivize people to promote more people biking for climate action goals, just to kind of keep that in mind that is there a way that we can start thinking about Mm -hmm. making that a priority. Let's just make it a priority and try to keep figuring out, keep it in the front of our attention. We do Thank do you. it on certain special projects. Like, so for East Hadley Road, we got CDBG funding mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. it wasn't for the roadway itself, but it was for the sidewalks, the multi-use path. And we were able to squeeze in a little bit of roadway widening. Mm -hmm. So we did, we added bike lanes there, yes. we added a multi-use path. And that was sort of, you know, so when we have special funding, when it's not our, our just our, the bulk of our regular budget, we try to squeeze those in under special projects. And then there's other times where the road might already be 30 feet wide. And sometimes you can squeeze an extra foot on each side and then you get a three foot bike lane on each side. It may not be a perfect four foot, but we do, if it's an easy enough, if it's already close, we do, and there's not a whole lot of trees, wetlands, et cetera, in the way, mm -hmm. we do squeeze out an extra foot or two here or there. And okay. we do try to, you know, squeeze it in where possible. I mean, you look mm -hmm. at Henry Street and there's trees and salamander crossings and 
And, you know, it's a scenic road. There's wetlands. There was, I would love to put bike lanes on that street, but there's no way you can get away with it. There's too many yeah. obstacles. So That's we do, right. on a case by case okay. basis, we do try to do it. Excellent. Thank but you. Maybe not the full four foot wide and maybe not the perfect scenario, but we try to accommodate as best as possible as many times as we can. But you, you have to remember that everyone likes a smooth road. And when you're talking about trying to accommodate everybody and make all the means of transportation, a bus going over a potholey road is probably worse than riding in your car going over a potholey road. So it's always the condition and, and the smoothest of the road, which actually brings the most people for mass transit, for bicyclists, they're, they're gonna enjoy it and get as much benefit out of it as the motorist is. So that's really the biggest, your biggest bang for the buck right there. Okay, Andy. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate the presentation and the discussion. I waited a little while to raise my hand for a reason. And that was that uh, before our current form of government, the last presentation on this was made to the select board. So I was the one who was there on the last presentation. And uh, I um, wanted to see if uh, things were different from where they were last time. And uh, I would have to say that my observation is in general, no. Uh, the names of streets have changed because some of the streets have been done and other streets have worked their way up on the list. But the basic questions and concerns were all of the same. And my other observation is probably from my finance uh, role as much as anything. And that is that the, big, the biggest challenge yeah. that we have is, uh, was, I think it was Anna was talking about uh, driving from one town to another and noticing the difference is a question of what our budget uh, capacity is in Amherst and the demands on our budget uh, because it's both revenue and uh, money coming in. The chapter 90 is really uh, based upon a formula and um, everybody is fighting over getting as much of a favorable formula out of uh, the state money as they possibly can. And so what we're left with then um, when you've, we've uh, got the number that comes from the state, uh, then it's whatever we can add to it from our own funds. And, uh, we, you know, so you get into then dividing up the capital budget and trying to see if you can do anything to reduce the operating budget so you can add more to the capital budget so that you can take streets and sidewalks because our constituents um, do complain as much about streets and sidewalks as, as uh, about anything else that we react to. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I think that uh, in the end, uh, we do um, have limits and, um, you know, probably need to discuss that as much in the budget scenario as the town services scenario. And, uh, but I'm not going to try it tonight to go any further than I have. So, but I, um, I then am left with my final thought on the subject, which is, uh, and this is said by others, is that um, it really is helpful to have a system that is based upon a set of principles and not based upon um, what we hear from certain constituents or the number of constituent calls beyond a certain point. I mean, I've, it's, I think that we, we sort of realize that at some point, if you get enough repeats um, requests in the street, it is worth sort of asking then the next question as to why that street is where it is on the list. But uh, you know, I think that it's uh, actually helpful for the legislative body to uh, ultimately say that um, the, the executive branch makes these decisions as to how to allocate very limited funds and uh, 
we certainly want to um, hear how that decision is being made, but I would be very reticent to put ourselves in the position of second guessing those decisions. So those were my comments, so thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And I see that Anika, I have a comment, but I'm gonna wait, hold a minute. Anika has her hand up. I just have a quick comment for Jason, and that is that I think that you should add another sign behind you and coin what you said about um, taking the politics out of paving. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, when you have a choice of uh, fixing a sidewalk or dealing a bike lane, I'm going to put in my thoughts that the sidewalk comes first because it deals, it's used by people of all ages and all physical fitnesses. And um, there's so much scientific uh, study coming out just on the benefits of simple walking. Um, I understand the answers on the Amity sidewalk, and um, it is a steep hill and it's a steep hill on Northampton Road as well. And yet um, when we were discussing uh, uh, the new um, uh, studio apartments on Northampton Road, we were told that most people wouldn't have cars and that we were to just imagine them walking up the hill with their groceries. And we know that they do. And I will tell you, there's tremendous foot traffic on Amity of all ages and uh, you know, running clubs from, the, from UMass, people walking their dogs, people with families. Um, there's no alternative really uh, to either it's Amity or Northampton coming up the hill. So um, uh, this is just made very vivid today. Today after a, a, a rally, there was a man with a walker just trying to walk on the side of Amity near the Amherst Coffee. Um, and it wasn't particularly a bad stretch of sidewalk but he had definite um, mobility limitations and he felt, you know, he didn't want any help either. I got to tell you that, that he should be able to walk with his little walker on that section um, right there in the center of town. So I am really glad that you've chosen to do the sidewalks uh, in Amity, which relate more to the, the public areas of the town. Um, it's a very challenging um, system that you have uh, in trying to do this, but just, you know, uh, we do have one thing that town of Amherst has that many towns don't have is we have rail trails, which uh, just during COVID, we discovered some of them for the first time. Um, uh, you have handicapped accessible, well, actually Hadley has it, but uh, the trail um, Silvio Conte State Park and the, also the rail trail in um, Amherst where people can do uh, walking if you have a car to take you there, okay? Because they're kind of inaccessible uh, otherwise. So I, I think we have a, a lot of good things that are that are in the works and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, and let's figure out ways to get more money uh, uh, to answer Andy's thing. Yes, this takes money and we need to get some more money. So I see Paul's hand is up and- um, yep. Just quickly, so quickly, I just um, a want to thank Guilford and uh, Jason for the presentation. I think this really instills confidence in how we approach these decisions. These are very, uh, complex decisions. We, we're very systematic and scientific about doing it. And there is the sort of, you know, we have a town engineer and, and experts who go out and look at the roads themselves and they look at them and things change from year to year. That's what we learned with Bay Road this year is that it wasn't on the list. And then this winter, it really blew open. And not only we knew that by driving on it, but we also heard from our constituents um, but also, the you know, if you look at the, we get eight hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars from the state for Chapter ninety. If you look just at Bay Road, that's a six hundred and sixty thousand dollar project. That mm. money doesn't go very far, and that's why we are always. You'll hear us always um, arguing at the state house for more money for roads. The state has not increased money for roads for a very long time. Andy Steinberg is on the um, fiscal policy committee of the. Um, MMA and I'm on the, on the public works policy committee. So we are always advocating. That's how it's the state has to step up and put more money into yeah. roads, especially for semi-rural communities like we, where we have a lot of roads and not many people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I will ask my question. Uh, are we expected to do anything in response to this report? No, okay. 
great. Uh, if I could, so what we wanted to do is take this presentation and then sort of encapsulate it and put it on the website for on the pavement where the pavement is, so people others can watch this. I think that's a very viable presentation. I think it's very educational as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I did announce this in my newsletter, um, but I don't see too many other people attending. We have an awful lot of meetings and a lot of things for the public to do, but I think this is a very worthwhile presentation and uh, we, we learned a lot. So I, I, I thank you very much. Um, so um, thank you, Jason and Guilford. And um, I guess you are free to spend your Thursday evening as you wish um, at this point. And um, we will, um, I guess, if you let us know when you get the website updated so we can inform our constituents. Um, I think Shalini, you really wanted to have uh, pu more public access to the information um, and that would be very helpful. Um, so are we, I think that's it for this topic today. Um, anyone have any counter suggestions or are we done with this? Okay. No, I just to, uh, also thank Jason and Guilford, thank you. Yes, I, I really found your, your, your descriptions, your explanations really, really useful. So I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Okay. So we have the next action item is the referral from the town council, proposed revision of fees under general bylaw 